there was this moment where I actually couldn't find my car because I didn't remember what it looked like. It was because I was just so fried. I was so burnt out. I have this very dicey place that I go to and maybe some of you go to this place too. It's like, well, once this part of my life is over, then I'll take care of myself. But what I say, especially when you're going through a tough time is lower the bar low because that's actually doable. And I think that we creatures are a lot more resilient than we think, but not if we're constantly running on empty. Something's got to give and that thing will be you. Well, hello there and welcome to a super special episode of the Terry Cole Show. I am interviewing one of my nearest and dearest friends for the last over 30 years, Chris Carr, about this most beautiful book that she wrote called I'm Not a Morning Person. The subtitle is Braving Loss, Grief, and the Big Messy Emotions That Happen When Life Falls Apart. Oh my God, this book is so beautiful and I lived so much of it with her. If you don't know Chris, I'm gonna talk a little bit about her because she is phenomenal and you should. Chris Carr has been called a force of nature by O Magazine and was named a new role model by the New York Times. Chris is also a member of Oprah's Super Soul 100, recognizing the most influential thought leaders today. Chris is an expert who lectures at hospitals, conferences, and corporations. Media appearances include Glamour, Prevention, Scientific American, Good Morning America, Today Show, CBS Evening News, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, oh my God, the list goes on and on, and The Oprah Winfrey Show. She also is the subject and the director of the documentary, Crazy Sexy Cancer, which premiered at South by Southwest Film Festival and aired on TLC and the Oprah Winfrey Network. Chris is amazing. She's an irreverent foot soldier in the fight against disease. Chris teaches people how to take back their health and live like they mean it. Her work will change the way you live, love, and eat. So this is, that's Chris's bio. I know her because back in the day I was a talent agent and she was a Broadway and television actress. That's how I know Chris. I used to represent her a hundred thousand years ago. And then we just became great friends. And in 97, I was diagnosed with cancer. And in 2003, she was diagnosed with cancer and her cancer, she still has, she is a cancer thriver. She has 24 inoperable stage four tumors in her lungs and her liver right now as we speak. But this beautiful book is about the loss of her father, Ken, and the mourning process and what needed to happen for her. And it really is a GPS on how to mourn, not just the physical death of someone, but our disappointments, whether it's a divorce, whether it is uh, a career that didn't work out the way that you want to, the importance of mourning is just everything you need to know is in this book. So I hope you love it. Enjoy my interview with Chris Carr. Hi, Chris Carr. Hello, my favorite, oldest, dearest friend. <laughs> How you doing? I'm so good. It's good to be here. I'm super excited to talk about I'm not a morning person right here. I've been carrying it around. I've been reading it. I love it so much. It's so good. Subtitle. Braving loss, grief, and the big messy emotions that happen when life falls apart. So I've got to start by asking, why why this book and why now? Mm. Well, Tara, you're one of my closest friends, so you know a lot of the backstory, but um, I'll start with the inspiration for the title. I'm not a mourning person, mourning as in grief, because for the longest time that was, was the emotion that I ran from. Like I would do everything in my power not to feel that. And I stayed busy. I poured alcohol down my throat. I did all <laughs> the different things that we do when we're running. And I realized uh, about three years ago when I was coming up against my 20-year cancerversary of living with stage four cancer, my dad was dying. My business was stumbling. We were in the middle of a global pandemic. I was like... I can't run from this emotion any longer and be well because it felt like I was just holding back a tsunami and it was exhausting me. And so I was like, what would it be like to actually sit with this emotion? Mm -hmm. And 
I think that so many of us, we've gone through our own losses, um, big losses, all kinds of losses. They come in all shapes and sizes, as you know so well. Mm -hmm. None of us are immune to them. And um, I knew I needed to go deeper in my own healing exploration of this. And so that's why it was this book. I wanted to write like a, you've got this, go out and get them, girl, kind of book. And I was like, I need some gin and a nap. Screw that. <laughs> You know, and I was like, this is what you need to write about because this is the stuff that's holding you and maybe some other folks back. Mm. What's so um, beautiful. There's so much about the book that I, I just love and not just because we're besties. It's the truth. Um, there is something so um, resonant about how you sharing your experience in such an honest way. And of course, you're funny as hell. So there's also levity to this whole experience, but the whole, there were so many different parts where I was crying and then I was laughing, but part of it is you were talking about, you know, sort of losing your shit in a CVS parking lot towards the beginning of the book where you had been keeping it at bay, mm -hmm. just keeping it at bay, thinking about, you would think about other things. You would find, you would think about dead mice. You would think about things to avoid. Anchovies, like I hate anchovies. Think about anchovies, you will not cry. <laughs> so what, happened in that like what got you to that point where you couldn't not cry <laughs> yeah well that was a big turning point because i knew my dad was um close to the last weeks days and i went on a very deep multiple year journey of being very close to my family and my parents not just emotionally close but like proximity, living very close to them during that time. And mm -hmm. I knew life as I knew it was wrapping up and his life was winding down. And I had been asked by my mom to go to CVS to pick up some more Insure because that was the only thing that he could tolerate. And I stood there and I didn't know how many to buy because I didn't know how long he'd be there. Mm -hmm. And I freaking bolted I was like just trying to get, it was like going in slow motion, trying to get out the door before the seams were going to burst, you know, and I got into my car and I just really let it out. It was probably one of the first times that I just truly let the weight of loss out. Mm. And it felt better afterwards. Mm. Um, and I was like, wow, there's something to this. Right. You know, it didn't mean that I wasn't suffering. Didn't mean that my heart wasn't shattering. Didn't mean any of those things, but I just... I felt better. And so that was a big turning point for me in that small private moment of the car outside of CVS. Mm -hmm. But part of the thing though, Chris, about letting, about feeling the feelings, because think about how long, right? So your dad was sick for a couple of years. Four and a half years, yeah. Right. So prior to this experience, because we were, we were both managing our parents' illness simultaneously during our first global pandemic and writing whatever we were doing, so many things that, you know, how long we could not um, acknowledge the feelings, like the Herculean strength to a degree that it takes to, you know, you were, you were the designated like leader to a degree of your father's healthcare, correct? To a degree. My mother was absolutely in charge and, you know, way yes. more on the front lines than I was, but I was a deeply active participant. Participant, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And your own cancer, you know, your own cancer experience. So let's talk a little bit about, you have this quote in the book, where you say that your therapist says that when the, tell me the quote. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, when the grief train pulls into the station, it brings all the cars. Mm. And this was so big, something to chew on. I continue to chew on because what I didn't realize, Tara, is <laughs> there were old griefs that I thought I was over yeah. that came back up for healing. There were other big emotions, you know, like the subtitle is the big messy emotions that happen when life falls apart. I didn't expect rage. I didn't expect shame. I didn't expect jealousy. Like all of these big <laughs> big personality um, were, were what I was wrestling with every single day. And just even hearing that 
gave me more of a sense of this is normal. And then my own philosophy is that, you know, it all comes up because we work so hard to push it down, you know, and we live in such a grief phobic, messy emotions averse society. We don't oh have God. tools for this kind of stuff. And, and my belief is that when we start to even slightly lean into feeling these much needed and often neglected feelings, the past stuff is like, yo, you guys, she's doing it. Let's go before she shuts down. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I want to be felt too. Yeah. They do want to be felt. And yet we don't want to feel any of them to a degree. And yet I think that part of what I really took away and really sat and thought about from reading this book was the value, like how important it is to slow down. Like I really, I'm telling you, it was in real time as I was reading that I was personally slowing down and checking in more with how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And then I was looking at my own grief train and I was like, are there, are there other things? Are there, you know, not just the loss of, because so much of what you talk about in the book as well. So yes, we're talking about grief, death and dying, certainly hospice and all of that, which we'll get into, but you're also really talking about the way we need to grieve the marriage that didn't work out or the, as you would say, like, what is your shit pickle? Yeah. That, that you were, you know, when things don't go the way we want them to living with, and for you living with cancer and being, being a cancer thriver with active cancer, right? You had to mourn your dream of getting that box checked. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I so appreciate you bringing that up because like we were talking about loss, all shapes and sizes, the divorce, losing your job, the miscarriage, uh, an unex a big unexpected and unwanted change, your best friend ghosting you and you don't know why. You know, mm -hmm. we're dealing with loss all the time, loss of our former sense of selves, which yes. is what it was for me. Like I thought my life was going to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I love my life right now, 20 years into living with stage four cancer. I do mm -hmm. love the life that I have created for myself, but that doesn't mean that there isn't mourning for the life that I thought I was going to have and certain decisions and opportunities that were no longer possible for me as a result mm -hmm. of my illness. Yeah. Right. So I'm not just looking at all of the rosy things. I can also say and sometimes it's really sad that we chose not to have children because it was too dicey for my health. Yeah. You know, and, and so I can go to that place and just be with that emotion as opposed to just running um, from mm -hmm. it. And I think that one of the things that happens for us is we think that if we go near some of this stuff, we're going to drown. Like it's going to be so big that it's just going to sweep us mm -hmm. away. And I, I, one of the messages in this book is that it's actually the opposite is true. Like the way out, it's, it's that saying the way out is through. Mm. And I like to, you know, give people this visualization of like, imagine holding back waves in the ocean and let's say you're strong enough and you are actually able to do it. But at some point they're going to start stacking and stacking and stacking. And as powerful as you are, you are not more powerful than the ocean. Mm. Right, And when it hits, it's going to hit so much harder and have such bigger ripple effect. And yeah. so what's another approach is diving through those waves. Sure. You have to hold your breath. Sure. You have to take a leap. Sure. It's scary to be underwater, but the more we do it, I feel like the more that, that we go in and out and in and out and the tides recede and they do mm -hmm. recede. Right. And it has less power over us, but I think there's something, you know, it being, um, over givers or being controlling, being high functioning codependents, whatever you want to, you know, these are all these different determinations that, that I say we are like, we want to make sure everyone's okay and everything is okay. Or as you talk about it in the book, natural born caregivers and how many of you listening or watching this right now on YouTube identify as a natural born caregiver. And you have all of this great advice, Chris. So let's talk a little bit about how to how to take how how do we deal in the world if we're a natural born caregiver? 
Oh, well, Tara, you're the queen of teaching us how to create healthy boundaries. So I'm always very grateful for that. And I always come to you when I need a tune up on that. <laughs> um, you know, there's all the things that we've heard, like put your oxygen mask on first. And, and that's really essential. But what I will say is it's it's the most essential time for us to carve out little moments for ourselves because it's a marathon. It's oftentimes when we're going through a very big life change, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And a lot of stuff is going to come up. And what we don't always realize is how it impacts our bodies, how it impacts our immune systems, our, our emotional well being, our mental health, our memory, our cognitive function. Like I remember, Tara, when I started to you know, I'd have my glasses on my head and wonder where my glasses were. And I was like, this is what happens when I'm 80, not when I'm 50. Like what's going mm -hmm. on? Or missing, misplacing my keys. And then, but there was this moment where I actually couldn't find my car because I didn't remember what it looked like. <laughs> and I've had the same car for 12 years, Tara. It's not a new car. <laughs> right. I read that in the book. I was like, wow, that's scary. And it was because I was just so fried. I was so burnt out. And so yeah. a lot, a lot, I think from, I'll speak for myself. I, I have this very dicey place that I go to that's naughty town, USA. And maybe <laughs> some of you go to this place too. It's like, well, once this part of my life is over, then I'll take care of myself. Mm. But when you're on a four and a half journey, four and a half year journey with a loved one, you cannot afford to put your health on the back burner for for that amount of time, no. you know, or once this next thing is done, that's when I'll, you know, go see my friend Terry and have that incredible experience of friendship and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so what I, I'd say the number one thing, I have a lot of self-care tips in the book is just yeah. like making those, those energy deposits, those little deposits on the regular. And I, another thing I think that many of us do is we set the bar so high, like if I can't do it perfect and go to the, ultimate workout at the actual gym that I belong to, screw it. Why bother? And what, mm -hmm. what I say, especially when you're going through a tough time is lower the bar, Yeah, lower your standards. I mean, sometimes you got to put the bar so low that you're going to trip over it and like give yourself a concussion. You know what I'm saying? I'm like seriously. low because that's actually doable. And I think that we creatures are a lot more resilient than we think but not if we're constantly running on empty, mm -hmm. you know, like something's got to give and that, that thing will be you. Yeah, indeed. So there was different stories and I don't know if this one made it in the book, but I know it from life. So I just wanted to bring it up. I'm trying to think, I don't think it did make it in the book. We were talking as your dad was sick and there were people coming in and there were things happening. Um, so do you remember the story about the caregiver who was making noise? <laughs> Can that you tell actually that didn't make it into the book, but yeah, I love you. You gave me big props that day. I was like, kind of wanted to tell my boundary coach how impressed I was with myself, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so what happened? Tell us. Yeah. So, you know, bless these individuals, bless these nurses, bless these people who do the home hospice work and mm -hmm. come into these situations where sometimes families are literally losing their shit mm -hmm. because everybody's stuff is up, drama, drama, you name it, you know, blessed. That was not what happened in our house because we would, we made very strong boundaries around that. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that was very important for us was really being mindful about the energy that you brought into my dad's room yeah. because he would pick up on it. And, and you could tell because after somebody would come in who might be like very emotional, he was at some point no longer able to communicate, but he would need more morphine after that mm. visit, right? So we're whether or not you're sitting at the bed of a dying love one. What I got from that is that we are such sensitive beings. And when it comes to energy, the energy that we allow in our space is is really important. And we want to be more thoughtful about it. I, I've taken that forward for the rest of my life. And I will take that forward rather if, you know. Um, but anyway, back to that point, that <laughs> moment. One of the nurses, amazing woman, you know, she'd sit with my father eight hours a day and 
I was there coming in and out and there's just all these needs that need to happen throughout Mm -hmm. the course of the day. These, but she would shuffle papers nonstop, like nonstop shuffling papers, like, and then like tapping them and shuffling them and tapping them. And I was losing my freaking mind, you know, and I'm thinking if he can hear this, which there's a really good chance he can, he's probably losing his mind too, but he cannot communicate. Right. I was like, I have to say something, but then tear, there was a piece of me. And I think maybe some of you out there listening can relate. Like, I don't want to hurt her feelings. I don't want to offend her. Mm -hmm. I don't want to come off as ungrateful. I feel so uncomfortable. Should I say something? Should I not say something? And on and on and on. Now you're having a wrestling match inside your head. And I was like, dude, if you cannot do it for yourself, do it for him. Yep. And it was just, and it was like, hey, Janet, would you mind not shuffling the papers? Because I think it's a little distracting. And also it might, if he can hear it, it might be a little irritating to him. Mm -hmm. I so appreciate you. And, and, you know, thank you so much. Yep. I was like, no problem. I was like, oh, of course. Sorry. I didn't even realize I was doing that. I'm like, how could you not realize that? (laughs) (laughs) It's incessant. (laughs) Janet, stop. (laughs) But here's the thing about that story that I loved is that it can not Set, it can sound like not a big deal, quote unquote. But the thing is, when we do something different, when we would normally just suck it up and be like, that was so effing annoying, we would just talk about it later. Tell, you tell Brian, you tell me, you tell, you know what I mean? And, and we would just let it go. That how much different you feel, how much more empowered you are when you say something and the person goes, oh yeah, no problem. And then it stops. So A, You're doing what you wanted to do, which was to advocate for your father and for yourself because it was bothering you too. But really, he couldn't do it. And so you probably wouldn't have asked her to stop doing it if it were just you and she in the room. But the fact that you were thinking it might really be messing with his piece sort of gave you the courage to be like, it's okay to to say what I need to say. And part of why I love that story is that it also illustrates that like, we're not that fragile. Mm-hmm. Ladies, Janet's not fragile. You're not fragile. Like nobody's fragile. And telling the truth shifts everything. There was another thing that you shared during this time that I wanted to bring up and then I'm going to get back to other stuff in the book, but about how grieving, when you're grieving, that you were able to prioritize your time what you needed to do. And so you, you had done an Instagram live where you just, just lovingly said, so anyone who has sent me a card or a basket or any, anything, I'm not reading any of those until I can get there. So eventually I will get there. Thank you. But it's almost like we're raised a certain way. We feel like we need to send a thank you note or we need to whatever the hell we feel like we need to do. And I was really impressed with you being able to not do that. So what inspired you? Well, to tell you the honest truth, Chair, today is my dad's birthday. So the day that we are recording this is such a special day. And I know that if the universe works in the way that I hope it does, he's getting a kick out of seeing me and you together. Again. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I have a stack of condolence cards this big, and they're all in a Ziploc bag, and I haven't opened them yet. Mm Mm-hmm. And he passed over a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I'm not so grateful for that outpouring of love. I wasn't ready and I'm still not ready Mm because I think that there's such a finality in that plastic bag. Yeah. And so it's just giving myself the space and trusting that the people who are in my life and who love me wouldn't be angry at me if I didn't read their condolence card. Yeah, because you know what? Your condolence card is not about the motherfucker who's sending it. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Like, actually, when we're thinking about it. I mean, some people give however they give, but that's the truth. It's about you. Yes. So hopefully, all the lovelies in your life, nobody nobody would be offended. But wow, if they were, um, I just want to punch them. All right, moving moving on (laughs) to... What, what I love about this book, Chris, is you, you share tangible and actual 
experiences of having the hard conversations and you share what Carol, your therapist had helped you with, but I, I would like it if you would just tell us a little bit about having the hard conversation. Like you got to a certain point where you felt like you wanted to talk to your father about death and yeah. about him potentially, obviously he was going to be transitioning at some point. So what got you there? You know, each chapter is broken down into the different emotions, experiences, um, you know, universal truths that happen when the rug gets pulled out from under mm -hmm. us. So from the moment of rupture, which is the moment that life changes to the, to all the fear and anxiety that come up and the difference between the two and how to get through the, that, that time or that experience. And of course, all these things keep coming around, right? Yeah. Um, there's a chapter on acceptance and all of these different places that I had to go. There's a chapter really on rage. I had to go to each of these islands to understand them more and figure out how to survive them. And then as he was getting closer to passing, there was that, that conversation and there was that experience that was coming up and it's like, dealing with the elephant in the room and not everybody wants to go there, but my dad did want to go there. He mm -hmm. did want to talk about it because as the person who's getting ready to transition, it can be very lonely to not talk about it because you're afraid that everybody else is going to fall apart. Right. And I had been really scared about the conversation because I thought I, there's no way I can survive this. Like I'll lose my shit and I don't mm -hmm. want him to feel bad or guilty or uncomfortable or, yeah. or have grief that he's give that I'm grieving. Like I was so bound up by it. And then my very wise therapist, Carol said, well, let's start real slow. And I think that the entire time I had to start in a much slower in, in a much <laughs> smaller way, as opposed to just like swan diving into whatever the, the ship pickled du jour was, but yeah. She said, why don't you talk to him about talking about it? So the section's called talking about talking about it. <laughs> it's not the actual conversation you're going to have, but you're going to have like a pre-show warm up. Yep. And you're, and so that's what I did. Like, would you like to have this conversation? And when we do, I want you to know that I love you. I'm probably going to break down crying it's going to be hard for me, but I'm really up for it if it's something that you want to do. And I've never done anything like this before, so I have absolutely no experience here, but I'm, I'm willing to show up for it. And that's how it's, that conversation went. He said, I would love that very much. Wow. Right. And so that was just the first step. And I was like, okay, I, I got that down. But I feel like there's something so respectful and beautiful about having the conversation because so much of the time people want to, we want to be seen. We don't want to be alone in the, that, that moment. And Hey, if he had said, I don't want to talk about it, you would have respected that as well, but he did want to talk about it. So when you talked about it, how did it go? I mean, it was all the things I thought it would be. It was beautiful and it was brutal. Mm. Um, but I think it was another thing that brought us closer. Right. This brings us to the, hold on, like the section where it's not either, or it's this end or what is yeah, that? Both end, both end. So let's talk a little bit about this. Cause I really identified with this whole section of how, um, complicated it, this is, especially with major losses and whatever. So let, let, t let's t tell us about the concept and let's talk a little bit about it and yeah, how did you manage I, the end? <laughs> I, absolutely. And, and I, I want to uh, circle back to this notion of like the things that people say to us sometimes and the things that we say that like words that are never supposed to go together too, because we're, it, we're all awkward when the shit hits mm -hmm. the fan. Um, and I, I feel like the conversation with my dad and how my therapist coached me to approach it really helped me sidestep some of that awkward stuff. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but to your question, 
it's this idea of the both and. So I think we live in a very binary world where everything's kind of black or white. You're either a winner or you are a loser. You lost your battle to cancer, right? The mm -hmm. hero's journey, the um, just even more so in the terms of cancer patients, like you, you're a survivor because you're in remission, right? I've been surviving for 20 years. I'm not in remission. Um, right. But we like to put people in boxes, and the thing is, is that there's nothing good that lives in a freaking box, right? Living in a box is living in prison. And, but we have Hollywood endings and we, everybody's got like this, even when we see it on Instagram, we only see the shiniest parts of people's lives. We only see their victories. And so mm -hmm. it's very difficult, I think, for some of us to say, I can be happy and depressed, you know, right. the, that that place of like living in the magnificent gray. Like for me, I have stage four cancer. I have 24 tumors in my liver and both of my lungs and I'm healthy. <laughs> I am a life loving, big hearted human and I live with anxiety, mm -hmm. right? It's just like, I am successful at so many things like major success. And I am so unsuccessful in so many ways. <laughs> and it's like, that's, I feel more true to a three dimensional life. Yeah. Um, but it is the, I think in many ways, the opposite of how we are domesticated and uh, what we are, what we see in society. Yeah. The duality of it. It's like, I feel like with my therapy clients, a lot of times there'd be guilt. Like they would almost feel like they had to keep mourning forever and ever. And that if there was any joy um, on page 198, it's like, I love this and it guts me. I'm excited about this next chapter and I'm depressed. I'm grateful and I'm grieving, right? I'm grateful. And I'm grieving because you can be both of those things. I'm energized and I'm exhausted. I feel closer to dad and yet so far away. I call this surreal duality the both and place. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. It, it, you know, I feel like, Tara, thanks for reading that. That sounded so beautiful. I love mm -hmm. your voice. It's so gorgeous. Um, mm -hmm. It's really about giving ourselves compassion. I think that's at the heart of this entire book. Uh, the, these experiences are normal. We deserve to do the heart tending work that uh, is necessary for the healing process and the process of evolution. And so I hope what this book does is give people permission to dip their toe into some of these scary places and know that they're going to be okay. What I feel like you're giving us though, it's a combination of like a roadmap of how to do it. And you so generously share what worked for you, how it went for you, how you handled it, how you managed it. But what I feel like, you know, Chris, is that you're bringing this topic of mourning to the forefront in a way that it so desperately needs to be. And especially after the pandemic, that there is so much more like I can't tell you how much, I don't even need to, but how much even online people are mourning the way their life was. Mourning, like changes happened during the pandemic for folks. Like we we will never not know that experience, right? Yeah. And it's just like being diagnosed with anything. You have to mourn your the way it was when you were innocent, <laughs> the way it was before you had a diagnosis or the way it was before you had the experience of losing one of your parents. And I remember feeling myself after my father died. Now we had the sort of the exact opposite experience where my father died very suddenly when he was 61 and just literally dropped dead of a heart attack. So, and both, both of these things have their, when you come from a mourning point of view or a processing point of view, they both have their, challenges, although I think that your father had a different emotional IQ than mine in the way that your dad was, besides being spiffy, as you say, he was always, he always looked so good. No matter, no matter when you saw Ken, he just like had his shit pulled together. Yeah, that right. guy, never, never sloppy. No, he was very, very, he was a little Bo Brummel, you know, um, but he was also accessible. There yeah. was something warm and accessible about your father that I was 
I was very always drawn to because I had a very sort of more of a inaccessible cold dad that I was kind of afraid of. And in the, for me, the death and dying piece, it was so um, like, I couldn't believe the world was going on. There was a part of me in the beginning of after my father passed that I was like so mad that people were eating lunch. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. I was like, don't these motherfuckers know what happened? Hello? Like what <laughs> is going on? I couldn't stop telling people. Just someone who doesn't even care, a bartender, I'm going to meet someone somewhere. And they're like, I remember I was in the Upper West. And I was like, how are you doing? And I was like, terrible. My father literally dropped dead seven days ago. Just died. He wasn't even sick. Just died. <laughs> the guy was like, uh, are you talking to someone, lady? Because I'm just a bartender, you know? <laughs> but there's there's something about the how you walk us through in the story of sharing your own life experience. There's a process that we can go through and it doesn't listen. We're all the same, Chris. This is what you're bringing to light for me mm. in this book that I thoroughly enjoyed and read literally in two days. Um, so you guys, it's out right now, by the way, so you can get it everywhere, everywhere fine books are sold. It's called I'm Not a Morning Person by Chris Carr, Braving Loss, Grief, and the Big Messy Emotions That Happen When Life Falls Apart. So you guys can get this on Amazon and whatever, but my, my, did I have a point or was I just telling them to go buy the book? <laughs> I, I think it was wonderful what you were saying, because you were saying that we're more the same than different. Yes. And we all need to, here's the thing about grief. The chickens will come home to roost, whether you invite them home or not. So what? I'm not a morning person is doing is showing you how to manage the unprocessed grief you may have in your life. Even if you don't have a parent or a loved one who's passed, when you have your own grief train and all of your own cars are attached and there's something so psychologically healthy and so emotionally liberating about going through this process with a funny and smart guide like you who brings it all down to a level where you only have to be willing and everything you need is in this book to heal your grief, right? To process your grief, to honor your grief because we're not like curing anything. Oh, beautiful. We're just honoring it, right? This is what you're teaching us is how do we honor it? What does that actually look like? I love this book so much, Chris. I love all your books. Obviously, we're friends. I love you forever. But I have to say, this is my favorite book that you've ever written. You guys, you want to go get this book right now. I'm Not a Morning Person by Chris Carr. Amazon, Chris's website, all the places. Tell everyone where they can find you, Chris Carr. Oh, my goodness. ChrisCarr.com and on Instagram at Crazy Sexy Chris. Well, I love you and I'm so grateful that you came and I can't wait for the world to devour this beautiful book. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Mwah.